Today, once again, I'm having a gas with preeminent cultural critic and hopefully someone I can call a friend of mine, Rob Henderson. Of course, we're friends. Great to be here, Greg. <laughs> Look at that, how desperate I am on camera to have people tell me that you like me. <laughs> um, yeah. What was that thing you said in something recent? On the front, it says, tell me you like me. On the back, it says, not you, though. Yeah, not you, stupid. That was That's it. Right. What's that? That's uh, So this was a quote from the uh, psychiatrist Eric Byrne in his book, uh, his 1964 book, Games People Play. And Eric Byrne claimed that people uh, wear what he called psychological sweatshirts. And the front says uh, something like, yeah, please like me. And the back says, but not you, stupid. <laughs> and this is sort of that push-pull dynamic uh, that he notes throughout these, these sort of games that he enumerates mm -hmm. uh, in, in that book, Games People Play. Really interesting book. I've been doing a series on it on my Substack, sort of on and off. I think this week I'm taking a week off from doing this deep dive. But that was a, a really um, a sort of a landmark book that sort of crossed over. You know, it's, it's funny when you read it, it's, it's very sort of dry technical language. You can understand it, you know, if you're just a curious sort of educated person uh, who likes to read books. Uh, but this this one was one of the, the the first, I think, to cross over into like the mainstream educated public. And uh, I didn't realize this, but but um, when I was reading, I think it was the Wikipedia page for games people play. Uh, you know, there's always the, the section about cultural references. And that book was actually in an episode of, of Mad Men, which right. you and I will be speaking about. Games People yeah. Play was in. It was in Mad Men. Very briefly, uh, uh, Dr. Faye Miller, uh, one of Don's uh, uh, what, romantic interests. Yeah. Uh, she's laying on the couch in Don's uh, apartment post-divorce. She's like napping on the couch and the book is like resting on her chest. And she, you know, basically implying that she was reading this, which makes sense, right? Because I think she is she a psychologist or yes. something in this. You know, I know she's not, uh, you know, Don, Don, when he has his, uh, his one of his panic attacks, he says, you're not a real doctor. Hmm. So she's not a real doctor, but I think she's a psychologist of some kind or uh, like an advertising researcher or something along those lines. Kind of like more than me. Something, it's kind of in the, the area of, of what our mate Rory does, isn't it? It, behavioral science applied to advertising and consumer practice okay okay yeah so yeah that would make sense then that she would be the character to have read that i think when that episode aired it was or the the, the setting was 1965 and that mm -hmm. book would be still i think on the bestseller list uh, at that point so yeah was it you that uh, was it you or chris who we were talking about uh, rob and rob and i had uh, breakfast earlier today and we were talking about um someone you've spoken to a few times chris williamson and so it could either be from your reading list or from his, and it was to do with don't read the books that are hot now, read the books that have been around for a lot longer, something like that. Was that yeah, you? Yeah, that, that quote, I mean, it's been, that, that the versions of that quote have been um, shared uh, I don't know the like the original source of this, but it's an it's an interesting idea that's been shared a lot. I think I've seen it from probably Chris. Chris, I'm, I'm sure he's he shared something along those lines. Ryan Holiday is another big one. Uh, you know, the popular is uh, popularizer of stoicism. Uh, another one that I've seen, uh, you know, share share this kind of quote: Naval Ravikant, the uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneur slash philosopher. And I've probably either you know, posted something similar or retweeted. And I think there's a lot of a lot of truth in that. I mean, you know, you can you can walk through the the sort of like the bestseller shelves of bookstores or what's what's uh you know walk through the airport bookstores and see what people are buying but many of these books you know they'll, they'll be forgotten in the next you know four or five years very few sort of retain relevance in the cultural memory but a book like like games people play that's still a book that you'll see i mean it's interesting like like which books will will remain on on shelves decades later mm -hmm. i think that's an indicator uh that they're they're sort of um there's something about them that that people uh, remain curious about even even you know decades in some cases centuries later so if you still see a book that hasn't been published in the past 10 years that still uh endures and is still uh, on on the shelves um to me that's 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 probably something uh, that people should maybe pay extra close attention to yeah let's go back to games people play because it was i couldn't believe it when you said that it was in it was in mad men because it sounds like and I could be wrong here. It sounds like it dovetails with uh, a hypothesis that I, that I have about Mad Men, which is what um, Rob and I decide, decided that we were going to do a podcast a while ago where we basically just take a scalpel or you know, analytical and critical eye to some popular TV shows, but like landmark TV shows. The Sopranos is one of them. We, we'll, we'll touch on a bit of that today, but I've not finished it. So there'll be a bigger one later down the line to talk just about The Sopranos. We're going to talk about Mad Men, perhaps a little bit of... Um, 
uh, delving into into the into the West Wing. But um, and the reason I the reason I mentioned that is because the reason I mentioned that we had this plan is because there is a sort of um, hypothesis I have about why Mad Men is so popular and why Don Draper is so relatable, despite the fact that he seems like such an alienating character. And it has to do with, it maybe has to do with games people play. So you've reviewed, you've just reviewed this book on your Substack, haven't you? So just go through the the the, the rough thesis of what it's saying. Yeah, so Eric Byrne, uh, you know, he was uh, one of the founders of this this uh, this field, uh, what he called transactional analysis, and you know, so so there are a few different uh, uh, parts to to his to his idea, but essentially, you know, people are seeking what he called strokes, mm-hmm. uh, and a stroke in in the language of transactional analysis is essentially uh, like validation, recognition. Uh, love, you know, just you know, uh, respect, esteem, all of those kinds of things that we would like to receive from from others around us. It's like a a, um, a moment of some kind of positive interaction. Yeah, like, like from here's someone. a little bit of positive emotion your way. Yes, you know, I, in that post that I wrote in my Substack, I, I uh, you know basically drew this comparison to to likes on social media, um, you know, like uh, like audience clapping that kind of thing. A like and, is how we've digitally codified that. Yes, a stroke. Exactly. Okay. So that's that's sort of a, a the digital version of a stroke. But in real life, it's you know a smile, it's a head nod, it's in 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 the context of games people play. Uh, Byrne defines games as these sort of like toxic interactions. Um, so so it's it's not the same thing as like mathematical game theory or like a board game or rituals or or any. Uh, basically, he's not saying that every single interaction you ever have is a game. He has this sort of narrow definition of games, which are these interactions that people uh, get into, in which there are sort of two levels. There's the sort of ostensible level of you know it, it appears what it is on the surface. You know, two people sort of interacting, but then there's this sort of um, uh, subtextual layer, this sort of secondary layer that people are often not consciously aware of, and what they're seeking is strokes. They're seeking, um, you know, existential payoffs, validation of this sort of unconscious, implicit worldview that they may hold. Um, so uh, uh, one example that I gave was, uh, and this is from the book, he has this this game. Uh, and, he, and throughout the book, there are about 36 games. One of the games is called uh, Why Don't You? And then and then M dash. So why don't you? Yes, but. And so the example would be uh, someone trying to uh, provide assistance to someone. Well, why don't you know? So someone says uh, that they, they they can't find a job, for example. And so you know, uh, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you update your resume? Why don't you uh, talk to so and so about a job? And each time the person receives a bit of advice, they say yes, but you know, like you know, I I, I can't open my CV because of this, or I can't talk to so and so because of that. And so the, it's this game of this back and forth of mm-hmm. why don't do you do this? And then yes, but no, I can't. Um, and the the uh, existential payoff, according to Eric Byrne, is that essentially the person trying to to give advice is you know validating themselves as a good person, trying to help someone, and then the person receiving the advice and shooting them all down is validating their view of themselves as put upon, as uh, perhaps a victim, or as someone who's actually smarter than the other person. So in, in in a sense, when you give someone advice, you're actually taking this position of like, here's a piece of information that I may know that you don't, and the other person is saying, yeah, well, you may think that, but here's a piece of information that I have that you don't know. Right. Yes, but this, and that's there's something that you didn't know about. And so they're uh, superficial on the surface level playing this game of like you know i'm trying to help you and i'm i'm telling you this isn't going to work but then beneath that is um, here's something i know that you don't the other person says yeah well how about this um and not every single case, of course, like Baron, Baron is uh, clear to point out that not every single um, uh, illustration of why don't you yes, but is actually a game. Sometimes people are sincere when they interact and someone is really trying to help someone and someone really is trying to seek advice. But in other cases, uh, especially when there are sort of repeated instances of, of, of advice given and, and then subsequently the advice being shot down, that turns into a game. He has this other example of like, if someone is seeking reassurance and you give it to them and they accept it, that's an honest interaction. But if someone is seeking reassurance, you give it to them and then they shoot it down, that's a game. Because what the person is doing is actually they don't they don't actually want your reassurance. They want to shoot you down. They're getting some kind of uh, implicit pleasure, some kind of unconscious satisfaction. Mm-hmm. So and, and you may have had these interactions. I mean, sort of like where, where someone says like, oh, I know I bombed that interview. And then you say, yeah, no, I'm sure you did fine. And the person says, no, no, I believe me, I bombed it because this and that and the other. And then you're like, oh, oftentimes you'll have this feeling of like, hmm, you know, I tried to I tried to, you know, reassure you. And yeah. yet they, yeah. You know, so so often the the, the, the point of the games people play book is that you know 
in, in the quest to seek strokes, uh, people can often fall into these, these toxic traps, uh, such that, you know, they, they, they're trying to obtain fulfillment from social interactions without being intimate, without actually putting themselves in a vulnerable position of exposing themselves. And I think maybe that's, uh, you know, maybe Faye sense some of this in Dawn and perhaps that's why she, uh, she there's likes a reason that that book, that book is, is as popular as it is. Yeah. Well, there's a reason that book's on screen in Mad Men mm, mm-hmm. because the whole thing is that, would you say that, um, I'm sorry, remind me of the author's name. Eric Byrne. Is yeah. Byrne, is Byrne part of the, is, is part of his heritage Jungian psychology? Uh, well, he he was trained as as a psychoanalyst, and this was this was how psychiatry was in the mid twentieth century. I mean, now things have changed. Now it's you know uh, pharmaceuticals and, uh, and neuroscience and so forth. But at that point in the mid twentieth century, psychiatry was very much rooted in this sort of Freudian psychoanalytic, and and I'm, I'm probably I'm, I'm sure he was familiar with with Jung as well. If, if he wasn't a trained Jungian, he was at least familiar with the ideas. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was some influence there. But it sounds like the um, again, this is. You are highly educated in this area, and so, and I am not, so I'm always wary of, you know, speaking out of turn on this issue, but I believe the idea of the persona is a Jungian term, hmm. and the persona, roughly, is a character you play to conceal your true self, let's say, hmm. so that your true self does not get criticized, and only the persona gets criticized, only the persona gets taken down, only the mask gets taken down, not the real you. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not, uh, you know, especially familiar with Jung's ideas, but I, I am familiar with the persona idea, and that would make sense. I mean, those ideas were floating around in psychiatry and psychology, and in trying to understand the human condition at that time. So. Yeah, in that sense, I, I think, you know, so, I, this is like, you know, maybe getting too much into the weeds, but I know that Byrne did have some disagreements with the psychoanalytic community. And he that and that's one reason why he founded transactional analysis was because, you know, he he respected Freud and he respected that those ideas. But he thought that there was like another way to understand uh, human interaction. So psychoanalysis, a lot of it was and, and, and the Jungian ideas it was about the individual. Mm-hmm. Right. Like what's going on with the individual, with the psyche, with uh, the, you know, the, the the persona, the the ego and all of these kinds of things in in terms of individual psychology, whereas Byrne was interested in um, social interactions Mm -hmm. in how people can sort of change in the context of sort of these interchanges with other people. Mm -hmm. And that's why he sort of coined this idea of of transactional analysis is like, so two people are interacting. um, And one thing that he liked to do was use uh, salesmen Mm -hmm. uh, as, as ways to sort of illustrate the idea uh, such that, you know, if, if if a salesman goes to a, a dinner party you know, of course, he may be having a, a pleasant time, an enjoyable experience. People may enjoy talking to the salesman, uh, but the salesman always has uh, an ulterior motive, right? Like on the surface level, yes, he's interacting. He wants to know about your family, your work, your job, all those kinds of things. And you may enjoy speaking to him because he's taking a very strong interest in you. But, you know, implicitly, the salesman is also trying to sell you insurance or what yes. have you. He's trying to figure out your socioeconomic position. He's trying to figure out, you know, how, how he can make a deal here. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the games people play, Byrne says, like, uh, people aren't, um, you know, they're not salesmen, they're not trying, they, they don't have like an economic profit motive when they're interacting, but they have a sort of an emotional profit motive, such, and, and they're not necessarily aware, the way that the salesman is aware, the person may not be aware uh, that they're seeking this emotional profit, uh, and yet they're doing this anyway. And so in a sense, you know, the the salesman is, is, is doing XYZ, uh, and it looks like it looks like one kind of scenario, but it's actually another. And people do this as well with their sort of uh, uh, social transactions and their quest not for for money, but for but for strokes. Do you remember when uh, someone is door to door selling? I think it's air conditioning early on in Mad Men. Hmm. Betty says, "My husband's a salesman." <laughs> this this everything about game, games people play keeps in keeps interacting with Don at some point. Yeah, yeah the, the the show is interesting because like so so with with Don and well with 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 most of the 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 characters but but most most prominently with Don is he he's sort of disconnected from himself and his emotions for for many many reasons but I wonder if one is because of his his profession where 
even even emotion is commodified to some extent right? right where like if he feels something in response to something you know the 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 gears start start moving in his head and he starts to you know, how can i how can i use this feeling to sell soap or or cigarettes or something to other people and when you sort of disconnect from your own emotions in that way and constantly try to figure out what is it about this emotion that i'm feeling that can be used to sell uh, merchandise to other people if that in itself may be sort of uh, uh, undercutting his ability to, to feel anything. Isn't that one of his first pieces of solid advice to Peggy? Where she goes, you know, sex sells. And he goes, says who? Mm. You are the product. You feeling something. Mm. That's what sells. Yes. Yeah. And that was an interesting scene for me because I, I so I, I initially watched Mad Men uh, back when it was still on the air, actually. I think I, I watched the first season in 2008. Eight, I want to say. I think it aired right after. So I, I was already watching Breaking Bad, the first season of Breaking Bad, which I think aired a year later. And this then before you were in the military, it was while I was in. It was my first year in the military. First year in the military. Yeah, and and I, I caught an episode, and there was something interesting about it. So so I kept going with it, um, and so I watched it more or less during the the period when it was on the air, and then I did a rewatch, uh, you know, during the twenty lockdowns of twenty twenty slash twenty twenty one, and. Uh, yeah, so so doing this deep dive into it as a sort of a more mature person, someone who uh, maybe understood a little bit more about uh, not only sort of the world, but also uh, by that point I was you know I was in the midst of my PhD, so I understood a little bit of something about psychology, and in the in the Mad Men series. Um, when Don says that, that famous line about, uh, you know, it's, it's not sex that sells, it's you feeling something. I had just read this study about how uh, um, sexual content does not predict, or it actually negatively predicts box office sales in wow. movies. So essentially, the more sexual content that is in a movie, uh, the fewer tickets those movies tend to sell. Uh, but but actually, uh, sexual content predicts uh, the likelihood of winning an Oscar. So sexual content doesn't really appeal to the masses, it seems, but it does appeal to critics and tastemakers. Uh, and so, but Don had his finger on on the pulse. He understood this, right? Like the I'm, I'm not sure if Matthew Weiner, whoever wrote that episode, understood that uh, sex actually doesn't sell. Uh, but uh, but that is borne out by the empirical research. Don was Don was correct there. That's one thing. I mean. The person we so often mention um, in these discussions, uh, Jordan Peterson, points out that um, uh, dramatists can know things before people have figured them out in an academic sense. Hmm. You you know, acting them out, you, you'll know things you didn't know that you knew. Right. Acting them out is confusing, but yeah. <clears throat> um, that's kind of what's so fascinating about Mad Men, because many things about this show, I think, don't point towards huge success, critical and commercial. Mm. You know, it's a niche industry, advertising. It's mm. not like the public actively try and screen out advertising. So it's an, it's not only a niche industry, it's a niche industry that produces something that people prefer not to have. <laughs> they prefer not to have their attention invaded. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, for a number of reasons, I'm like, this didn't just, you know, The Sopranos, is there's something sexy about violence. There's something that's, that's cool and gonna get people's attention, but executives making adverts why did this get people's attention so much and that's part of why i wanted to you know kind of discuss this partially just that whole subject and also the hypothesis that people relate to don so much because on some level you for, for you know for people watching you kind of have to know the the the, the full backstory you know, the full backstory of mad men which is explained in season one and you know i suppose we'll put a spoiler alert on uh, on the episode because uh, a big part you've seen it haven't you Patrick of course I have. Patrick's behind the camera I'm just making sure I'm not spoiling it for him um, <laughs> um, Don Draper is a, you know his false identity and he really is you know farm raised uneducated Dick Whitman mm -hmm. um, anonymous unqualified everyone else in Madison Avenue went to Princeton or Brown or Harvard or you know um, but he's more successful than all of them Mm -hmm. And it's a successful persona, you know, and I, I wondered if part of the reason we all find Don Draper so fascinating is because all of us present some character to people and preserve like a, a kind of inner real self, the real me. I don't know what you think about yeah. that generally. I think that's right. Uh, I mean, the, the yeah, his character. So, so yeah, you're, you're right that the Mad Men series never reached... Um, 
uh, like nearly the same level of popularity as The Sopranos. I think at its peak, it it it, it reached something like two million viewers when it was on the air. Right. Whereas The Sopranos was you know fifteen million plus fifty uh, one five one, one five. five okay yeah yeah which Still. is which is for HBO right like premium cable like you know so and again like Mad Men was on basic cable so like it, it actually could have reached more it had a higher potential a higher for ceiling our, for our viewers in the UK yeah. let's just translate that so this is also twenty three years ago because cable yeah. is an American term right? all right 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 um, well yeah yeah I mean yeah so you so, could so, access Mad Men without paying for the channel yes exactly you had to pay for HBO yes you had to pay extra. And and yet the Sopranos still reached more uh, uh, audience members, but but Mad Men appealed to uh, a certain subsect of the population: uh, people who made more than a hundred thousand dollars a year, people who had college degrees, uh, and it was a sort of a, a, a darling among the critics, and mm. you know the the those the, yeah. And so I think there is this uh, this feeling among a lot of people, you know, even even regardless of whether they they have the the educational pedigree or come from this kind of family or that there is this sort of imposter syndrome, I think that a lot of people feel and Don, you know, it was, it was sort of exaggerated for dramatic effect, but yeah, Don came from the sticks and he grew up poor and he reinvented himself, which is, I mean, that, that in itself is a sort of a classic American story. Uh, well, that is the American dream. The question is why is he so paralyzed by embarrassment of being the American dream? Well, I I think uh, because it was uh, because he was around people who didn't have that. Maybe his I mean, were his his fears may have been un, unfounded. They may have been unreasonable. Right. Because as we yeah, you said, so spoilers alert. Yes. Already. But later in the in the series, Don does come clean. And it's funny because so that was the, the season six. I want to say it was the season six finale during the Hershey uh um pitch when he comes right. clean to the client to the client right not even to his friends or family <laughs> yeah he comes clean to the the cl- yeah so i guess we'll be jumping around a bit because there's also the famous uh, episode with betty where he reveals himself to her of course um but yeah when he comes clean to the client and to everyone else uh he does get put on like a leave of absence right but yeah. it wasn't because of his background or for be growing up poor it was because he chose chose like the the exact wrong moment <laughs> You know, it was an unprofessional thing to do, right? Um, but the, the the pitch itself was interesting in that, um, and that was a theme throughout the the series as well, where Don has this famous line during the Hershey pitch uh, when he breaks down and he says, uh, "the the what was it like the the inside looked like what, what, what was on the wrapper, yeah, right? Like the the Hershey wrapper is this you know this chocolatey brown color, and then the <laughs> inside, so the outside looked like the inside." And there was a scene earlier in the series, I want to say maybe season three, where Don is talking to uh, this client, uh, Roger's old lover, uh, where she's trying to sell, I think it's dog food, and Don suggests changing the label. And he says, you know, the product is still good. It's just the label that needs to be replaced and and change the the wrapper and the cover and the packaging. And so that is a sort of an implicit theme throughout is like the inside versus the outside, mm-hmm. you know, and and uh, and Don was pushing for that. And so, yeah, Don. Yeah. And anyway, so so after he reveals himself, uh, you know, his friends are still there. Right. Like no one abandons him. He you know gets to keep his job and people are upset with him, not because of his background, but just because of the professional faux pas that he made. Um, but with the episode where he revealed himself to Betty, he did lose her. And, and and the show is kind of ambiguous about whether he lost her because he was lying to her or whether it was because, um, you know, Betty came from this sort of waspy, well-moneyed background. And you know, maybe to some extent she was uh, shocked and perhaps embarrassed that she had married this man who was from a different social class than herself. Yeah, because when they ultimately separate, in my memory, it's just it's not just because of. But the straw that broke the camel's back is, is, is his just, you know... Um, prolific infidelity. But it's not only that, right? Because that's one thing that surprised me about The Sopranos. We'll be, again, ducking and diving and comparing and contrasting because I think in some sense those are kind of the same show on some levels and we did we, mm. we, we swapped some similarities on the way up to this. But one thing that's interesting in comparison is that Tony and Carmela Soprano, Tony is very straight... Uh, t- she knows what he does. Mm. And also, so she knows what he does for a living, basically, but without knowing the details. Rob's kind of looking around because he knows I'm only on season four halfway through and doesn't remember <laughs> where what I know and don't know yet. Right. And also, uh, so she knows about his infidelity. She knows about his profession, although not in the detail. And she uh, remains 
with she stays with him mm-hmm. um you know uh and betty doesn't know about the infidelity at first and when she does find out about it then it falls apart there's this weird implication with the sopranos that if you're honest about your dishonesty that you can try and like maintain some of the structure something like that yeah it, well it, it, it's also a sort of a part of the 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 culture of the mafia right like having a what do they call a gumar uh and i i i don't know if it's uh, so so betty i think had suspicions as far back as season one mm. uh but she didn't have any proof until until the second season when uh she when when uh who is it uh bobby barrett's husband the 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 comedian guy yes. basically just tells her right uh but in season one uh, uh, Betty's friend, uh, Francine, mm-hmm. uh, you know, breaks down crying and, you know, basically, uh, uh, discloses that her husband's been cheating on her. And then Betty, uh, uh, relays this information to Don and says something like, you know, how can you do that to someone you love? And, and I, th- I think when she said this to Don at, at dinner later that day, uh, she was looking for some kind of reassurance from Don that he wasn't doing that to her. And instead, Don says, uh, who knows why people do what they do? Whoa, yeah. <laughs> Which is like, uh, you know, that's that's uh, probably not the right thing to say to your wife who's telling you that her best friend is being cheated on. Um, but I think in that moment, her she, she had already had suspicions. And that was when it was more or less confirmed in her mind. But she didn't have material evidence. Until His later. inability to join in the moral judgment. Yeah, exactly. Was, yeah. was, yeah. the, was the, the smoke that mm-hmm. led to the fire. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I didn't, I never noticed that about, about uh, the Hershey's story about mm-hmm. the one of the reasons he's so emotional about it is because it's try it's 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 not a lie. It's the same on the outside as it is on the inside. Mm-hmm. I never noticed that as like a straightforward analogy for Draper. Yeah. Um, but um, the weird thing there's um, I remember there was a popular so there was a few video essays about Mad Men that went around a few years ago, and um, there's this popular idea that's like everyone thinks they're like Don Draper, but really they're like Pete Campbell. I saw that one. Yeah, yeah of course. That, yeah. Um, but really, uh, even, even and, and there's, there's a good video essay that points this out, even Don Draper can't carry out being Don Draper because it is a character. And it's, it's, he's, kind yes. of, he's kind of styled on the, what would you call it? Like the, the, the Hollywood heroes of the era, the 50s. He's kind like of- Gregory Clark, Peck or- Clark Gable, yeah. Gregory Peck-esque. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Sean Connery, James Bond. Yeah, yeah, a bit of Bogart. He does wear like the kind of the Connery Goldfinger suit. That's the Draper gray suit, isn't right. it? So yeah. well, it's not three piece for anyone who's really interested in that. Yeah, Don is a, he's a product, right? He, like Dick Whitman created this, this uh, an, an advertisement for himself of, yes. of this sort of Don Draper, master of the universe. And yeah, I guess that is the one of the ironies of this show is that Don Draper is not even Don Draper and he's a walking advertisement for success, despite on the inside feeling sort of insecure. Uh, I mean, the, the the pilot episode, you know, Don, Don is a, I mean, this this is always always happens with, with pilots of, of any any sort of series. But it's just jarring to see like you know the pilot of, of Mad Men or The Sopranos and then see how the series progresses. But in the very first episode of Mad Men, it's interesting because Don is simultaneously portrayed as a master of the universe, but also extremely insecure and scared. Mm-hmm. In the opening uh, uh, scene, right, he's with Rachel in bed smoking a cigarette and says something like, I'm over. They're finally going to know. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I have no ideas for my Lucky Strike account. And you know, he has this line about the young, young executives are going to be picking meat off my bones. Yeah. And all the way up until the, I'm you know, losing that, that sort my of, edge. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Losing my edge already. And you know, uh, right up until uh, the moment when he has the flash of, of brilliance and does the it's toasted tagline, uh, you see this this man who's just like completely self-conscious, insecure, uncertain of himself. And then he pulls a rabbit out of the hat at the last minute. Uh, and then you sort of see from there he transitions into this person who is so cool and so suave. And what he says, you know, what does he say to, to Rachel in that meeting later? Like, I'm not going to let a woman talk to me like this. And oh, yeah. Storms out. And yeah. later he has those, you know, the smooth line about not, you know, love was invented to sell nylons and he seems yeah. like this very suave cool cynical character but it but the first half of the that, that episode in the pilot is like you know my career is over yeah and it's weird that they let you into that side of him first mm. everyone else sees it the other way around so mm. obviously you're firmly on his side the whole time you kind of know all the secrets before the audience does oh interesting so yeah, maybe that did make him a more sympathetic character you know there's that whole idea of, of save the cat 
you know, of like having your character either do something uh, praiseworthy, you know, so the save the cat is like, you know, have a scene where the main character saves a cat or, or some, you know, version of that to get you on their side to win you over and uh, or have them put in a position where they're they're, uh, you know, they're flailing, they're, they're embarrassed, there's something you could, they, that they're not completely competent or something to get you to sympathize with that. And I think maybe that was what they were doing actually initially. The Sopranos did this too, where the uh, opening scene is is Tony crying about the ducks in Melfi's office, right? Like the first scene of Tony isn't like running the guy over with his car and beating him up and yeah. like taking money and like being a badass, right? It's like him in Melfi's office you know, saying, I'm depressed, I have panic attacks, I love these ducks. And it's like, ah, oh, this big, lovely, you know, teddy bear monster. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, so they have these seeds, I think, initially to get you to sympathize before they show you this this other side that they become more well known for being a, a, an advertising mastermind or a uh, like a mafia boss. Yes. And in fact, The Sopranos uh, is very, very uh, effective. And I think more so now, I'm not going to go so far as to say more so than movies like Goodfellas that it's clearly, clearly inspired by. Mm. Um, they mentioned Goodfellas and The Godfather 2 in the first 20 minutes of Sopranos episode one. Yeah. Um, so they're not, they're, they're very open about their uh, influences. They have a, a, a body double of Martin Scorsese going to the club mm. in season one. Christopher says, I want to be a writer and make <laughs> movies, you know, Goodfellas, shit like that. <laughs> you know, so they're all very, they're, they get it out of the way very early. They go, this is all we yes, know the we, movies exist. Yes, we get it. <laughs> Sopranos is slightly better than anything I've seen recently at being worse than you thought it would be. Uh, the violence is worse than you thought it would be. And it keeps mm. managing to make it to 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 go a step further. See, every season on season, it goes a step further than you thought it would. Mm. And, um, you know, so season... F um, uh, end of season three, where he is embroiled in an affair with Gloria, um, who he picked up at the psychiatrist office, which, you know, even then, even then you're like, uh, you know, Tony, for God's sake, you don't pick up women in the psychiatrist's <laughs> office, you asshole. We can all see where this is going to go. Right. Um, he's embroiled in this affair. Um, and yeah, you know, you think you've seen things be as bad as it can get, but um, there's a moment where I think she basically threatens to tell his wife they're having an affair. Uh, uh, and in the most convincing way I've seen on t TV, Tony just strikes her right across the face, and my uh, my palm sweated when I saw it. I had an actual like like fear response, mm. amygdala response. So it was really really brutal. Why am I saying all this? Because yes, it sets him up as a sympathetic character. And you mentioned uh, the other day that like people are often confused by the fact that they like Tony Soprano, mm -hmm. um, and is that because that's Mad Men is Mad Men is a less dramatic example of that where it's like it's an anti-hero mm -hmm. it's you know you kind of know why you sympathize with don and whilst he is it, it presents his infidelities his un, his lack of faith in his marriage as truly it is terrible that is a bad thing to do it's uh, it, truly terrible in the sopranos that's like the least of tony's crimes <laughs> right so why do people like him so much yeah it's a, it, well yeah so he's his like tony's behavior is more reprehensible than don He's, uh, there, there are, yeah, there are multiple questions about why he was able to win the audience over, right? I mean, so I, you know, Don Draper has built in advantages for, despite being an anti hero, despite uh, uh, committing morally rep reprehensible acts. He's extreme. Like John Hamm is an extremely good looking man. He's and, like, like if AI had made the perfect right. movie star. And he's not good looking in like this sort of pretty boy way that would only appeal to women. Right. Like, like Zac there's, Efron. There's, yeah. There's a masculinity to him that men respect too. Yeah. Right. The square jaw. You know, he's he's got the sort of the build and the huge and, and, voice. And, tall. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so even men can sort of understand why why, uh, you know, Don would be an appealing person. Um Whereas Tony, right, like well, James Gandolfini, I mean, I think like his portrayal of Tony is the greatest portrayal of any character in any medium, like movies, theater, like at least that I've seen and that I'm aware of. Yep. And to be able to carry that for, you know, seven, well, like six and a half, I don't know, they broke season six up, but like, you know, for that, you know, 90 episodes or whatever it is to six portray Six and a half years. Yeah, that character um, for so long, especially because he was playing against type. I mean, if you look at interviews of James Gandolfini, he's like the opposite of Tony Soprano. I had no idea. I watched yeah. his Emmy acceptance last night thinking he's gonna be like, hey, thank you very much, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, the and he's like, he's like this less East Coast, like uh, educated yeah. guy, you know? Yeah, he's- a, Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah he, the, 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 the Jersey accent, he had to uh, take like vocal coaching to do that. The really? mannerisms, the, the, the movement, like everything about him. Whereas like, yeah, if you watch him in interviews, he just seems like a very nice, like normal uh, guy, right? 
and so he his portrayal of Tony is, is fascinating. But then yeah, Tony himself is you know not not especially good looking. He's like a regular looking man. He's, he's a, very a balding, ordinary, overweight, gap yeah, middle aged, yeah. gap tooth. How like, is this the alpha male that we yeah, admire? What's, what's really interesting is that so so I've read some some interesting articles and chapters on on like the 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 making of The Sopranos, interviews with David Chase, the creator, and initially when they were trying to cast for Tony Soprano, they had uh, Michael Rispoli, who later played uh, Jackie April Senior in season one. Got it. So so uh, Jackie's uh, Jackie Junior's father. Uh, I think he, he had cancer in season one. That's and right. Passed yeah. away. They wanted him initially to play Tony because he still had this sort of like mafia appearance. They did, of course, cast him as one of the mafiosis, but he was slightly better looking and he had a full head of hair. And yeah, he was Godfather. Yeah, he was a bit overweight, but, you know, you could still, you know, he was almost like a better looking version of James Gandolfini. Uh, but then when they had Gandolfini in to, to, to read for the role, like David Chase was like, in the real world, that would be the mafia boss. Right. Right. Like that's that's who we would see. Um and so they ended up casting him. And yeah, there's uh, there's this sort of like charisma, this larger than life quality to him. And I think there's the, the, the interesting duality, right? Of like, yes, he's a he's a mafia boss. He uh, is a violent criminal. But the show opened with him in therapy. Um, you know, of course, like putting him in that vulnerable position, he cries in the pilot episode, uh, which I don't think you see that many other. Well, I guess Don Don does cry, but I'm, I'm thinking of like Walter White or something like a lot of other violent antiheroes. I don't know if you ever see them. Certainly cry. not in the first episode. With, yeah, definitely with, not in the first episode. With Walter mm -hmm. in Breaking Bad, there's two instances, one where he's kind of um, completely... Uh, it looks like he's 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 on severe painkillers after a, a fight with Mike in front of his son, and he mm. basically apologizes to his son, saying, "Sorry, you know, I'm, I'm not oh, there for right. you." And then the second time is when he's on the phone to Skylar, mm. pretending that she's not an accomplice. You remember in like Ozymandias, yeah, yeah. the anti-penultimate episode. That's it. Yeah. Oh no, no. no. So, so now I'm thinking. There, the, the other when when he allows Jane to die when she chokes. Ooh. Right, yeah. and you see, there's a tear that runs. Yeah, so, so, but, but you're right. The, the pilot episode. These are in. Know. These are peak moments. Yes, exactly. But the most memorable. In, with Tony, it's in. It's in the first yeah. five minutes. And and he's crying not over horrific acts he's committed, but because he's scared of losing his family. Yeah. Right, with the ducks in the pool and Melfi's sort of Freudian reading of what that means, and um. And so I think that sort of wins us over to him and, and to, to helps us to, to understand him. The other thing I think is interesting about Tony that the audience responds to is, um, at least for me, I got the sense, you know, on my second rewatch recently is Tony is extremely uncomfortable with his violent acts. And there's uh, the, like he he was we, we, we understand that he was sort of forced into this life because that's who his father was. That's who was like all of the male role models he had in his life were in the mafia. And he almost didn't have a choice. The, the show sort of plays around with this, too, where he gets into these debates with Melfi about free will. Mm. And, you know, he says, like, how come I'm not making pots in Peru? You know, it, it, she's like tries to tell him, well, we have we have choices and, you know, our, our, our destiny isn't set in stone. And Tony was like, you're born into this. You are what you are. Yep. Which and is why he's so, so distraught about his, his son is like how yeah. are we going to save this kid and that's the other thing right is mm. that like tony we, we the other thing we the reason we understand why tony actually isn't comfortable with his chosen path is because he tries so hard to get his kids away from him mm -hmm. right like he doesn't want aj to be uh like like uh, uh inducted into the crew he's he does everything he can to to ensure that they're not in the life he you know encourages meadow to go to college you know this she and or he, he and carmela are very proud when she goes off to columbia and they want her to be a doctor and he, at one point, Tony in a session with Melvi even says, like, I want her to be a pediatrician and just mm. get, a, you know, far away from me. Not, and then he says, like, not, not geographically, not physically. And, and Melfi understands. She says, I know what you mean. And so, yeah, there's uh, there there are more layers, I think, to Tony Soprano than any other antihero. Right. Including including Don. I mean, Don is like, Don is complex and interesting, too. But um, sometimes I wonder if, like, he's so good looking that we just, like, infer complexity at him. And maybe it's, you know, it's not it's it's not as uh, as deep as maybe we we, we think although there is clearly a lot of depth there that's what that's what that's that's the that's the stab through the heart that really begins his transformation mm. the criticism that you just gave is what one of you remember he has to fire a copywriter mm. um who uh, who says to him uh Don says to the guy, some of us have character, uh, you don't have character. He goes, you don't have character. You're just handsome. <laughs> yeah. Like they actually put that in the show, what you're yeah, suggesting. Maybe right. he actually doesn't have character. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, it's undeniable that Dodd is a talented uh, ad man, right? I mean, that's uh, that. It's it's interesting. Like the pilots, the way that they establish the characters. I mean, this is why these are two of the greatest shows of all time that we're talking about it in Mad Men, right? You see the the self consciousness, the insecurity, and then you also see the brilliance mm-hmm. within uh, like a twenty minute span of he thinks his career is over, and then he you know he comes up with this amazing tagline for Lucky Strike. And yeah, so so Don is talented and he's good looking, but in terms of his character, yeah, did 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 Don have a strong moral character? I think he he did relative to especially this is this is sort of established in season one, relative to the other guys in the office. Um, and they did this with Tony too, where Tony is like a monster. But if you compare him to some of the other guys in his crew or his um, the, the 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 unsavory rivals they pit him against, uh, like like Ralphie Cifaretto or oh, uh, Richie yeah, Joey Aprile. Pants. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Like Dot is, or, or, or Tony is, like you know, relatively less monstrous than they are. And I think Don, it's the same, right? With 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 Pete Campbell in season one, right? Like yeah. Pete was such a great foil, I think, in, in that season one, uh, like the arc where where Pete is trying to blackmail Don and like trying to. I, I, I mean, what was going on with Pete? Where he was, um, he was an accounts man, but he wanted to be in creative. Yes, was, which is well, that's. I think that is more of a nod to the industry than something that could be widely understood in the broader culture because uh, in advertising classically it's not so much the case anymore i'm pointing up here because loads of ad agency names up there um classically uh the creatives were king Mm. they are making the the thing that will cure your business problems Mm. and you know uh, they're the top of the hierarchy that's you know why it's appropriate in mad men that don is revered like a king by client and by um colleague alike and so if you were in accounts, you were prevented from ever being the bride, being, you know, you'd always be the bridesmaid. And mm. so there was this temptation to try and cross over and go, well, I've got an idea. How about this? You know, I know I'm not a creative, but, you mm. know, and Pete Campbell jumps right. In. I have ideas, direct really? marketing. You know, I thought of that. <laughs> Turns out it already existed, but I came with it independently. I'm here for the Greg impressions. These are <laughs> I'm going to try not to do too many because I bet they're good in person, bad on YouTube. But what I mean is, yes, yeah, definitely... Um, it definitely happens in the industry that people would like to be creatives because mm. as well, creative is a kind of, it's a romantic title, isn't it? It's mm. like saying visionary or artist. It's right. with a professional uh, thing attached to it. Yeah. And, and Don has the famous line of uh, Sterling Cooper has more failed artists and intellectuals in the Third Reich. There you go. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and you see, uh, so now that you're explaining, yeah, so so the, 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 the value they place on creativity, I'm thinking of that scene in season one where Ken Cosgrove gets an article published in the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, exactly. Uh, and account man crossing over yeah yeah do, do, yeah an account man doing something creative and it was and he didn't write a, a non-fiction article about the ad agency he wrote a, a fictional short story that got into this prestigious magazine and the other uh well not only so so pete was was envious and uh paul paul a, a creative That's he was right. also like they were like you write you yeah know? yeah he's well, paid yeah. to write yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and so they were, they, yeah. They, they on the one hand they they were envious, because, but then on the other, you know, they 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 admired it, and there was that there was a sort of an interesting complexity there. And so yeah, they're the like Pete Campbell as a as the foil for Don. I think that worked well because Pete Pete wanted to be a creative. And there was even that scene where he tells, I think he tells Rod, well, he tells all of the senior execs. He said something like. You know, I, I I've had these ideas, but then I get here and you people and you and you all tell me I'm good with people, which is strange because I've never heard that before. <laughs> which That's was, one which of the was, funniest lines yeah. in the whole series. Yeah. And and uh, and then, you know, behind the scenes when they're all in Bert Cooper's office, you know, you understand why they put him in that role. Well, because, back into games people play right, now. because of, you know, the Dykeman name, because I guess his family, you know, there's like like they're blue blooded wasps that, you know, well moneyed family that go way back in, in, in New York City. Big American yeah, industrialists. Exactly. And so they, they you know, there's a pedigree to his name. So just by having him work, he's he's a little sort of a bobble of status for the agency for him to be working there. That's right. For to to trot him out to to go play golf with the clients is like a big deal for for the for the agency. And so then, yeah, he's so so Pete has the the pedigree, but not necessarily the talent, at least in the creative, um, at least in the creative domain, whereas Don has the talent in the creative domain, but he doesn't have the pedigree. And so the, the, the Roger they, Sterling says to him, doesn't he? You're bad at relationships because you don't value them. Yeah, right. And yeah, so he's bad at, at dealing with people, whereas Pete, at least, he, you know, he, he tries to be good. He tries, you know, he through, through his accounts role, he manages to. Uh, well, I don't think you're jumping around, but that's where uh, uh, Lane Price 
uh, tells uh, tells Pete, you know, like like Ken has the gift of. Oh no, no, he says like you're. you're some, what is I he you know exactly where you're yeah. going. Um, what does it, he say? And it's, it's a paraphrasing. I might not get right, but he yeah. says, you know, you ha you have the wonderful ability to you know make people feel like their problems are being attended to. Yes, Mr. Cosgrove has the superpower of making them feel like they don't have any problems. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so so uh, you know that which indicates that like Pete is you know he's trying, he's making an effort, he's he's good with people, whereas like you could yeah Don could never be an accounts man, right? Like he has that that sort of haughty uh temperamental the, the artistic temperament right that sort of stereotypical like he's he, very elite. yes exactly he can't he can't deal with people because he's he's too much of a creative genius mm -hmm. um and so so that that yeah the 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 clash between him and pete throughout season one was was excellent and one thing that i found interesting throughout that whole series was how Don, I guess he had something of of a character arc, but it wasn't much of one. He starts out being, you know, unfaithful to his wife and unhappy with his job and feeling unfulfilled. And then he kind of ends that way, too. He has a couple of breakthroughs. He, he may have made like incremental progress. Whereas Pete, Pete really does transform. If you compare season one, Pete, to, to the end when he's getting on the plane with Trudy and they get, you know, she, she re-invites him into the marriage and they get back together and everything like Pete is like, he, he's a, a very different person. At, at the end, you would, I think I would almost rather hang out with Pete than with Don, right? I know what you mean. Um, Whereas at the very beginning, it was very much like you'd much rather hang out with Don than with season one, Pete, like season one, Pete is like a, a slimy backstabby, like you just wouldn't, you wouldn't trust anyone around that guy. I, truly the, the, uh, the, the most hated character all of the way through. Mm. And I wonder if part of what's going on with Don is that we start out in Don's 36. Maybe we've missed his arc mm. and we're just seeing it on repeat. And a lot of people's conclusion of the ending of Mad Men is that you're about to see the whole thing just reset and start again. <laughs> I don't like that interpretation. I want it to oh, be, no. I want it to be a transcendence. Yeah. But yeah. Well, what was your, uh, I mean, so you're talking about the end when he's at that like quasi spiritual retreat and he's meditating, right? That's so right. At the end and he has that like kind of smile and then it cuts to the, the Coke commercial. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, like the first time, the very first time I watched it when it first aired in 2015, I didn't get it. Like, I didn't get that cut. Like, yep. the, like what what were they trying to get at here? You know, That's maybe, also yeah. maybe something that stops it being perfect is if you have to, if you, I mean, you're a smart dude as well. You yeah. know, you've just done your PhD defense at Cambridge and you went to Yale University. And um, obviously you, you do get it since then. But if something if something doesn't present itself on any level straight away, it's not like, you know, usually you understand something and then there are more levels beneath it that mm. you didn't understand. Yeah. But when something's like a head scratch, it's like, the hell does that mean? Yeah. You know, that might stop it from being classic. Yeah. Well, at that, I was at a different place in my life at that time too. I was, I was still in the military and I wasn't like thinking about television in that sort of deep way where there could be like multiple layers of like, like, like themes and symbols and motifs and all of those kinds of things. I, I still was watching that show mostly on a surface level, although maybe on some like unconscious level, I was picking up all of the sort of subtleties, but that one, that one did go over my head the first time. Then the second time I watched, it, I got it. Um, what did you take? Yeah. From it? I mean, I, I think it was like, like Don once again. Yeah. yeah this, I, I hope, you know, so, so, okay, I, so let's, let's, let's box it, them out. Yeah. I think Rob's about to do the cynical yeah. interpretation of the end of Mad Men. So let's have it. Rob yeah, Anderson's so, cynical interpretation. So, so the cynical interpretation is that, that Don, uh, does what he always does, which is he experiences some kind of a pleasurable emotion. He maybe makes like a bit of, of internal progress in his journey and then where his mind goes next is how can I commodify this feeling to sell a product? And, you know, like on, yeah, when I rewatched it, I was noticing throughout that final season or the second half of that seventh season, uh, Coca-Cola, like the Coca-Cola symbolism is everywhere. It's pervasive. Uh, you know, people try to win Don over to, it was it McCann Erickson yep. with it's like dangling Coca-Cola saying, you know, if you want to work for them, come with us. And then there's, uh, this scene where Don is at the motel and he tries to, I think he tries to help fix the Coca-Cola machine. That's right. Yeah. And then the end is a Coca-Cola commercial. And it's like, you know, the show is trying to beat you over the head with like, hey, you know, Don's about to about to sell some Coca-Cola here at the end. It's also um, it's it's significant because I think it was like the biggest brand of the 20th century, wasn't it? That old McDonald's. Yeah. And, and but then I guess the, the, the non-cynical interpretation, which I, I, I'm less inclined to believe, which is just that, like, that was an iconic commercial. And it's just sort of setting up this parallel of like, you know, the, the good feeling you get from this commercial is the sort of same feeling that Don got 
Scott when he was at that retreat and he did sort of transcend and make progress. And there's probably you know, there's probably endless interpretations, but those were two that 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 sort of came to mind when I watched it that second time. What the, did you think? The one, so yeah, the, just to, to box those up. The one interpretation is that uh, he went, experienced something, figured out that he could make a killing, went back to McCann and made that commercial. Yes, yeah, that's one interpretation. Um, the let's call it the extreme sort of other naive interpretation not naive but the the other end of the spectrum that's less Mm. cynical is that you because the final thing you hear before the song is a little gamelan as it goes ding Mm. as it lights up the nice interpretation is that he achieved enlightenment Mm. he found peace and you know by focusing on the inner self Mm. in a meditative way there's the symbolism of the fact that he was by the cliffs he had nowhere left to run Hmm. You know, he'd reached the end oh, of the line. Right. Um, so had to look somewhere else for the answer. And maybe he found it. Mm-hmm. Um, but with the, this, the, there's a tertiary interpretation or there's a, there's a tertiary sort of element to it, which is that it predicted what has been the obsession of advertising, certainly for the last five years, uh, which is called purpose-driven marketing uh which is you know we're greener we're cleaner Hmm. uh if you buy from us the world will be a better place i'd like to teach the world to sing Mm. is could be the woke anthem and it's the (laughs) coca-cola commercial so it also predicts this perhaps sincere intentions of idealistic young people being completely harnessable by brands as well well, I watched this uh, this interview with Matthew Weiner that took place like shortly after the finale aired, and Matthew Weiner he he was he was a little bit cagey about the you know whether there was a, an objective interpretation of the ending. But one thing he did say was that like that that commercial. Uh, it wasn't intended to be a cynical move to to air that commercial at the end. And Matthew Weiner you know, basically made this point that like, what five or ten years before that commercial aired, you couldn't show uh, advertisements with black people and white people together uh, in the same commercial. Wow. Um, whereas in that, you know, like the Coca Cola commercial that they aired, you know, it's it's a famous commercial where they have people from all over the world, different races, backgrounds, and so forth, all together with a Coca Cola, and it does have this sort of hopeful message. Like, yes, they're selling sugar water, mm. but the 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 message and the imagery and the 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 interpretation of it is actually pretty hopeful and optimistic and so yeah i think it, it does it kind of has you know it it um it's appealing to to either interpretation right it is it is cynical in the sense but it is uh, there is an optimistic stance as well that it takes uh which which like the whole ending could be, you know, like is it like did Don make progress or not? Maybe, maybe both. Like it's not impossible that Don did have a breakthrough and he sold Coke and yes. he had the happy ending uh, internally and professionally. Well, I mean, yeah, that would be something to hope for. But uh, it's interesting the point you um, just touched upon, which I didn't know it was illegal to show uh, multiracial advertising campaigns. Yeah, I don't know if it was. Uh, well, not it, illegal, yeah, but. I don't know if like what the the legal status was, but I, I, it, like either way, it just wasn't done. Like whether yes. de facto or de jure, it just you know, you couldn't you couldn't do that. Um, at least that was my understanding of what what Weiner was saying with uh, with that commercial. Like why it was such a. I mean, it was a breakthrough for multiple reasons, but that was one. Was uh, it was a it was a novelty to 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 have uh, that kind of a commercial air that sort of transcended those the, the, those uh, those boundaries in the U.S. So it's interesting. You know. Because now in advertising production, the that's an explicit requirement to have, you know, multiple ethnic groups in the same and the same thing. You know, it's it's part of yeah. the thing you have to do for the commercial. Yeah. And um it's in there's an, so perhaps in that sense it's another interesting prophecy mm. that what was once revolutionary eventually became not only um expected but compelled. Hmm. So yeah, yeah. I mean the 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 whole series, I think, it, it was interesting the decisions they made. Because some of the advertisements that they came up with, like that Don came up with, like the It's Toasted tagline, mm-hmm. my understanding is that that tagline had existed, that predated 1960, but they depicted it as Don came up with it. Yep. And I guess the implication with the finale is Don came up with the Coke commercial. But then there were other taglines and and ideas that they batted around. And they had real clients, right? Like they were working for Topaz and Vic Chemical. Hines was a real campaign. Oh, that was. Okay, yeah. right. Um, 
and so, yeah, I found that interesting too. Like when they decided to, to actually borrow real world uh, examples of, of successful campaigns versus when you see Don and Peggy and the others brainstorming and coming up with their own sort of interesting ideas too. And uh, like the, the London Fog campaign and yeah, the, the whole, um, yeah, the decisions around that are, are interesting to me. And I also wonder like, what were the complexities of like getting these real world brands to, to be um, uh uh, involved with the show in that way, you yeah. know, like uh, that must have, uh, well, I guess initially it may have been risky because you don't know if this show is going to be successful, but I would bet by the end, it, it's almost like a status symbol to be shown on Mad Men. Like yes. that in itself is uh, something to be happy about. Right. Like when you see Betty washing the clothes with Tide, you know, like with the old school, like night box from 1963, there is like something cool. Or like when Don's cracking open the old like Budweiser cans with uh, the little opener, but before they had the, the pop tops and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really cool to see all of those like details. Um, all of the period details of the era and, and they didn't beat you over the head with their themes either, which I appreciated where you and I had talked before about how like one of the, the undercurrents of the show is this sort of, uh, like the, these haunted veterans of, you know, Don is a veteran of the Korean war. Roger was a veteran of the, of world war two and Duck Phillips as well, Duck Phillips and in Okinawa and, but they, you know, of course they allude to it because it was a big part of American culture. Um, but they're doing their best despite like these horrific uh, experiences that they had. They're doing their best to like put on the suit, get get on the train every morning, go to work, behave like civilized men after, you know, spending their early adulthood, like witnessing murders and violence and all this stuff. And now you're supposed to just be this sort of uh, gentle provider family man. So that's something that binds the Sopranos and Mad Men is that it's both about men that are traumatized by violence they've committed as well. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting parallel too. Yeah, I mean the like the, Tony's character. Yeah, he he commits. Yeah, like he well, it, it's like direct with him, right? Where you actually see him commit all of this violence and then go home, which I think is yeah another another compelling element to him. Where uh, you know you'll the way that they the the way that they sort of domesticated Tony with the uh the look of the the bathrobe and the boxers and the wife beater yeah and he just looks like this suburban jersey dad you know going down to get the newspaper and it's it's hard to fear yeah. him when he looks like that yeah right and so uh, he can turn it on like on and off on a dime where he'll he'll go murder someone and then go home and be this you know suburban dad trying to trying to be a good father and a good husband and i, I think w weirdly he may have been a, a better husband and father than, than don despite his infidelities and perhaps it, it is that sort of uh the legacy of like the the, the sort of the the catholic italian mm -hmm. cultural value that they assign to to family and then and then also maybe that carmela sort of implicitly understood the arrangement that they had where tony would have these these girlfriends on the side but tony would always come home for dinner yep. uh whereas don it was like he, like he would just disappear for two weeks yeah. <laughs> and like leave his kids. Yeah. Right. Like it wasn't like, yes, it was like a lot of people focus on like how poorly Don treated Betty and how like, yes, when he was around the kids, he was a good dad, but he wasn't always around. And when he left for those two weeks in California in season, was it season two? His kids didn't know where he was either. Right. Right. Like what kind of, <laughs> who would do that to their kids? Right. Yeah. Um, so, so in some ways I think there's, there's an argument to be made that Tony was a better uh, husband and father than, than Don. But what, do, what do you think? Well, um, the interesting, the interesting contrast between those two shows is that you have people, they're both about men succeeding in the most spectacular way in both legitimate and illegitimate mm -hmm. ways. So one's at the top and one's at the bottom of the American dream or the hierarchy or whatever, the sociopolitical accepted order, both being bad family men. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, to your question, who's the better father? That's a really, um, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, because I think bizarrely enough, Tony Soprano is more genuinely concerned for his children than Don Draper is, hmm. uh, because I don't think Don, Tony, uh, to, uh, Tony is distraught at the end of season three because AJ gets expelled and Tony sees that as yet another inevitable step on the way to yeah. the life of crime. Right. And he's saying, how can we save this kid? Mm. And he's almost in tears. He actually cares that his kid does well, but for some reason he never makes the connection that, well, if you just spend time with him and do good things with him, then that yeah. job done. Don doesn't have those questions. Mm. Uh, the children are often regarded in Mad Men like inconveniences, really. Mm. You remember in the first episode, Betty uh, finds... Um, 
So Sally. Sally. I was going to yeah. say Sophie. Sorry, everyone. Uh, Betty finds Sally with a plastic bag over her head yeah, yeah. and says, my clothes that were once in that bag better not be ruined. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, I thought that was a... Well, there were there were a few of those moments with the kids. And, uh, and yeah, regarded as inconveniences. And I thought th- those were just sort of commentaries on that era where parents were just less concerned with the safety of their kids, right? Mm. There's also the scene where Betty's driving when she has that sort of... Uh, whatever it was, the episode where she like crashes into uh, someone's front lawn because yeah. her hands start shaking. And the kids are just like playing in the... Like no car seats, no yeah. seat belts. Just yeah. like... And that was... My understanding is like in the 60s and 70s, that was just like no one even thought, gave a second thought to those kind of, you know, the, the norms we have today, the strict norms around safety came because things were so violent. Yes. <laughs> and so uh, people were just so unconcerned about the risks back then that like kids would get hurt all the time and there were injuries and deaths. And then eventually these laws and regulations and norms cropped up to contain that. Um yeah. So, so yes, Tony, he's, I guess there's, he's a sort of a, a more, what, like a higher variance character in that he does care more about the kids, but he also, he places them in way more danger, right? Like just by living in that house, mm. like he is placing all of their lives at risk, yep. right? With the, the wars that he has with the other mafia families, with the, uh, like all of the people that his, his underlings deal with, uh, the, the, the gang wars, the, yeah, just all of the, the violent activities that he's involved in and all of these sort of extra legal activities, he does place them at risk, but he, but you know, in his own mind, he may not think of it that way. He probably thinks that like by being there, he's keeping them safe or something along those lines. Right. But actually he's putting them in increased risk of danger. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, interesting. but yeah. And Don is, yeah, there, there's sort of like this absentee quality to it too, which I guess is, that is a sort of maybe a commentary of that era as well with uh, like the baby boomer generation, like Sally. Sally Draper is a baby boomer. And my understanding is that those kids were sort of overlooked and neglected by, you know, their their fathers who were veterans of the war, who were sort of emotionally checked out the way Don is. And then their mothers who were, you know, maybe their attention was spread too thin with trying to care for the house and for the family and for mm-hmm. their husbands and also maybe feeling like they um, missed out on their careers. And yep. so there's there's that aspect, too. Um, so, yeah, they're the the they're. The show is like, yeah, their their failings as 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 family men, despite you know at least attempting to try, but in their careers, they're they're both inordinately successful. Uh, so much. I mean, I, I like how this show sort of treats Don as like this. Uh, he's very much a, a highly sought after person. He's aren't all these other agencies? They're constantly fighting over him, aren't they? That's the strange. That's yeah. from a, from a, from an ab- advertising professional's perspective. It's really weird that. You know, uh, yes, it's weird to think that everyone is the only thing that doesn't make sense about the show is everyone seems really, really impressed by Draper and his way. And there's like, there's a mystique. What's he doing over there? But still in Cooper isn't particularly high up in the, the, yeah. the business leaderboards. The big right. ones are the ones who are still there. You may yeah, see McCann, BDO, Ogilvy, McCann, Ogilvy, DDB at the end yeah. of Adam and Eve there. That's, you know, Doyle. Is that, back. Well, was the implication there, at least initially, my understanding was the reason why Don liked, well, first it was his big break, right? There's, we could talk about that scene too with Roger, how he sort of uh, uh, maneuvers his way into that position but then also Don didn't have a contract. That's right. Right. And, and that's a, a, a key aspect of his character is he's flighty. He's worried. He's, you know, he stole another man's identity and he's technically breaking the law just by being called Don Draper. Yeah. And so he likes not having the contract. Uh, but yeah, so, so the scene where he, where he gets hired, there was the, that, that flashback where how did it he was a fur coat salesman and he was roger fur, yeah, yeah, and he was just doing the signs in his own store roger was trying to buy a coat for i presume his mistress I it was joan think. was it for joan yeah, yeah he buys the fur coat for when they're still carrying on their mm-hmm. their affair or yeah this was this must have been in what like the the mid 50s uh, yeah, yeah. yeah because otherwise the implication is that don rose to creative director in like four years which it was unlikely. It was a, yeah, I thought that the timeline, I mean, a lot of shows, the timelines don't completely make sense. And I get that, like, the sometimes the writers have to do, like, what do they, they call it, like, retconning, where they sort of have to readjust the timeline to get things to make sense. Yeah. But if Don is the creative director in 1960, the Korean War, I think he was there in 1951. So he somehow, like, you know, met Betty, had kids, rose to creative director all in the span of nine years. And that's kind of hard to believe. Yes, but- and one also gets the sense that really they wanted Don to be in World War 
War Two, but he was just too young. You know what yeah, I mean? too young. Yeah, because I guess the character must have been 1925. Uh, yeah, he would have been, I guess he could have technically, but he would have been extremely young. It also would have been difficult to whatever they would have to do with the makeup and the digital, All you know, that, yeah. to, to get Don to look like he was, you know, 18 years old in World War II versus what, 25 and the They would Korean have done War. it now, no problem, but this was 06, <laughs> right, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. Right. But um, yeah. something that, uh, something else that, um, that ties the two, ties the two together is the bizarre system of ethics that, uh, you know, emerge. And I think, well, the, what, again, one of the reasons we're hovering around these two things is because they caught everyone's attention and it's not obvious why. If you're trying to say, why would Mad Men be so successful? It's about advertisers and it's really slow. Mm. So it's not obvious why. Soprano is a bit easier because organized crime, but why it, it's it's spectacularly well thought of and remembered. And, like and regarded said, as one of the greatest TV shows of all time, of all possibly time. the best. Yeah. Like, w- what so. are they saying about us that we are like, yes, that's absolutely what life is like. You can relate, you can relate to people. In, I, I can relate to people in organized crime. Why is that? I have my life is nothing like them and so in terms of the bizarre system of ethics it's about you know what what is right and wrong um what is right and wrong irrespective of the law now obviously in sopranos they mean that they underline that irrespective of the law clause the law does not apply to them they're a lawless society Mm. and so they have their own bizarre moral code um that they don't understand and that's like us people are like that we have our own bizarre moral code that we don't understand Mm. so let's take a couple of examples that really stuck out to me one christopher gets made Mm. paulie comes up to him afterwards after the bit where they said is there anything you're unsure of because you can back out now if you want to well he goes along with it. And then afterwards, Paulie comes up to him and goes, by the way, now you're a made guy, you owe me six grand a week. You know what I mean? It's like telling someone the job description after they've accepted it to them. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, that's like, so that's okay. And then the other, what was the other thing that really confused me about their, um, about the way they handle things ethically in, uh, in the Sopranos. Um, uh, I forget. So I'll hover on that one for a minute. And then, you know, so, so there's that. And then in Mad Men, you remember they basically prostitute Joan to win the Jaguar account. Yes. Yeah. That Don's was... the only one who thinks that's actually wrong and shouldn't be done. Yeah. Everyone else just thinks it's kind of, well. And, th- and that was his, uh, I think that was, it, it wasn't overt. I mean, one of the great things about both of those shows, but I think more so Mad Men uh, was just how uh, subtle it was. And I think the reason, I mean, you know, Don has his, you know, peculiar code of ethics. And I think part of his objection to using Joan to, you know, prostitute herself, despite, you know, she was agreeing to it, you know, reluctantly, but she did agree to it to to get the Jaguar account, is that he himself grew up in a brothel, right? right? Like Don grew up in a whorehouse. He has sort of complicated uh, feelings around sex and how transactional it can be and so on. And, you know, even, even despite his infidelities, you see him sort of have a, you know, a, a somewhat sympathetic, uh, chivalrous, uh, approach to, to gender dynamics. I mean, I'm thinking of the, the scene in, in the first episode. Well, well, one of the, the, the very, for the pilot, right, where, where Pete is, um, you know, speaking in a very sort of vulgar way about Peggy, right? Like, oh, you, you know, you got the new girl, Don, and, or, or no, like Mr. Draper, I don't know what he's called. I think he still was referring to him as Mr. Draper, but you, know, you have this new girl, you know, I, I'll, I'll bet you're going to, you know, do whatever, like, you know, and, and Don pulls him aside and says, like, you, you know, if you're going to talk that way, you know, no one will like you. Yeah. And, um, and then there's another scene in that first uh, season where Don is in the elevator and these two guys are are speaking about, uh, you know, in a very sort of crass way about some some uh, secretary. And there's an, an older woman in the elevator with them. And clearly they can overhear everything. And Don sort of steps in and tells him to take off his hat. But really he's saying like, hey, shut up. Yes. Like we have a lady in the elevator with us. Yeah. Um, Again, Don doesn't yeah. think it's wrong to treat them that way, but it is wrong to talk about them in front of them. In front way. of an old lady or yeah. in front of an older. Yeah, exactly. So he has his sort of, uh, yeah, but, and, and so he has, um, yeah, there's, there's an undercurrent of, of chivalry, but it's complex. It's, he's not like a, a boy scout or, and he's not a pure good guy, mm-hmm. but in this context, he doesn't want Joan to, to, to do this. Um, and with, yeah, with, with, uh, Chris and the, uh, the example where he has to give Polly, like he, there was something in the job description that he wasn't aware of. I think that's like, that's a common experience that a lot of people have. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, uh, in the context of the mafia and the show, but in real life, you often don't learn what you have to do until you actually get hired. And then suddenly you realize that you may have to do things that you're uncomfortable with yeah. or that that's actually going to take you longer than you expected to, to, to learn on the job. 
And yeah, Chris's reaction to that was so interesting because he wanted to be made for so long. Yeah. And then he gets this like thing dumped on him. It's like, ah, okay. Well, it's, yeah. in that sense, that's just the classic, be careful, what is it? Be careful, be careful what you wish for, you might just get it. Kind yeah, of exactly. Yeah, so it, it, it's a, yes, a strange underworld version of when you get more responsibility. It's just, it is more responsibility usually. And mm -hmm. there's a big, big learning curve associated with that. But um, the other things in Sopranos that concern there, just strange, strange approach to morality is, mm -hmm. you know, for example, I mean, Ralphie is truly one of the worst characters in history. And I think Joey, uh, I can't remember his full name, but we call him Joey Pants informally. Obviously, I had a record-breaking couple of years. He was in The Matrix and Memento and then The Sopranos. Right. Uh, so he was a big deal back then. He's really good at playing a snide, unlikable dude. Yes. Um, it, 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 again, what a shocking, shocking scene of violence beats his uh, pregnant fiance to death. Yeah, who Tracy, is the a, stripper. A yeah. stripper and a prostitute. And that's kind of... Uh, you know, they, they, um, it becomes more of a, a beef between Tony and Ralphie about social niceties. Like, Hey, I asked to have a drink with Ralphie and he said, no, mm. and not you have, it killed someone in cold blood and really shouldn't be associating with people anymore. Yeah. Or, uh, uh, Tony's reasoning for, so, so right after Ralphie beats Tracy to death, that's right. Tony takes him aside and starts beating him. Yep. And uh, and then his reasoning was that he he disrespected the Bing, right? Yeah. Not that he beat this girl to death, but yeah. he disrespected the establishment by committing this crime and desecrating this, you know, it's, it's a strip club. <laughs> but like, yeah, he disrespected his. But the life itself business. wasn't the main reason he gave yeah. for being upset, right? But but that was the reason he was upset. That's but right. because of this twisted code of ethics, he had to cite something else that would be acceptable in that world. Uh, because probably because he knew he would sound weak to the guys if he said like, I mean, he, there was that brief moment where he sees the body and said like, this girl just had her 20th birthday. But then later when he beats up Ralphie, he has to give this other reason for what happened. And yeah, that was, uh, it, it, well, so I, I read an interview with David Chase about like, well, first of all, about the, the character of Tony Soprano and, and apparently David Chase was, um, perplexed about why people liked Tony, which you and I have touched on, because I guess he didn't he didn't expect him to be as likable as he was. And he also, David Chase, didn't like how um, gleeful a lot of the viewers were about the violence really? and about, um, you know, how how excited they got when they saw Tony commit some act of violence. And uh, and that there was something about that that, that David Chase uh, didn't enjoy. And so he may have put that scene in basically like because that was up to that point, probably the most graphic and stomach turning scene of like beating a woman to death who's pregnant. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was his way of sort of like rubbing this in those the faces of those viewers of like, OK, well, if you like violence, here's what violence looks like. And here's sort of like an, a, an ex especially egregious example of this. Um, and so, yeah, I, I thought that like David Chase's whole relationship with the audience and and he himself may have had sort of conflicting thoughts about it because he created an extremely compelling character and an extremely compelling show. But with them, yeah, was not trying to glorify or right. romanticize. It. Yeah, you're not trying to glorify. Or, but and yet people some, you know, you can't control your audience's reaction to your creative mm -hmm. work. And some people will take the wrong message from it. And and I, I, I remember. So when I watched The Sopranos the first time through, I was uh, in my early 20s and I did watch it on like a surface level of like, oh, this is cool. Just like mafia guys beating people up and shooting each other. It's so fun. And then when you watch it again as an older person, as a more mature person, you're realizing like, oh, there's all these complexities and that this isn't that kind of show. But I think that's actually why it became popular. You know, these sort of these contradictions of like the reason it became popular was because it appealed in both ways to people. It can appeal to the sort of like the shallow superficial viewer who's just like, oh, you know, can we speed through these boring therapy scenes and get to, you know, Tony, you know, banging another Gumar or beating another guy right, up. Right, right. And then the, there's the sort of the more, um, what, the more curious viewer who actually enjoys the therapeutic scenes and the sort of the symbolism and the complexities of the relationships and Tony's discomfort for with his chosen life and yeah the therapy and, scenes are usually my favorite scenes yeah yeah I, I find them interesting too and, and i guess with mad men too right where maybe another reason why mad men didn't reach the same heights as the sopranos is because it didn't have like you know these these graphic moments of, of i mean it, it sort of doubles down on the sex maybe to compensate for it where you know don has so many i think he i wonder if anyone's ever like tried to to totally add up didn't. how many how many gumars tony had versus how many mistresses tony, uh, don had and, and to see who who won that that uh battle royale but uh you know, Don, Mad Men has much more sort of uh, scenes of seduction and sex, but no, not much violence. Um, and so it was a more subtle show for that reason as well. Uh, and there is like, 
you know, there is this kind of like there, there's 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 conflict and sort of indirect aggression, verbal aggression, where these guys are competing to to outstrip one another in their careers. But it's much more subtle and you actually have to uh, pay close attention to when they're trying to uh, undercut one another. You know, like the, the scene where Freddie Rumson uh, pees his pants and they have to sort of like haul him out of the office and put him on leave or do they i think they 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 technically put him on leave but he basically they get He's rid gone. of him right and 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 Pete and and well, well Peggy when she likes Freddy right she's like oh you know she's she's sort of lamenting the fact that he's gone and Pete is like are you kidding we're all going to get promotions <laughs> right like like that that's a scene of like like people who work in that kind of world and uh, they they understand right they understand that like when a senior person is on their way out like that's a that's an opening for for the junior executives um and to sort of experience glee at that moment is like it's it's uh it's distasteful but you kind of understand it and that is kind of how uh i don't know if aggression is the right word but like conflict is portrayed right is a mm-hmm. is a sort of a more sanitized version of it um you rose to some online prominence because you wrote a new york times article about um understanding class through the west wing and the fresh prince mm. i thought the fresh prince was also interesting because it's like Mad Men and The Sopranos, it's an example of people succeeding in the American dream, you know. Uh, only this time, the successful alpha male is not the protagonist in Fresh Prince, Philip Banks, you know. Oh, right. It's not about Phil, it's about bothering Uncle Phil, right. Right. you know. But what was it, to just to tell everyone why these two shows really got your attention and you learned something through them. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's the the, the backstory. To, well, so, so I grew up watching The Fresh Prince just as a kid, you know, watching the reruns. Um, cause that show aired, I think in like the early nineties, I didn't watch it until later, uh, the, the reruns on, I think Nick at night or something. Yep. And that, yeah, I connected with this show just because I had, uh, I, I had this experience when I was growing up of, of trying to figure out what direction to take. I was growing up in foster homes in LA and bouncing around a lot and, uh, and very aimless. I was terrible in school I barely passed. I mean, I barely graduated high school, but there was something interesting about Fresh Prince where it was the it was a sort of a fish out of water uh, a show where where Will, you know, he's he you know, the, the famous theme of the, the show, right, where his he gets into a fight that his aunt says, you know, you're moving with your auntie and uncle in Bel Air. Mm-hmm. He goes to move in with his aunt Viv and Uncle Phil and you know, you're sort of seeing that world through Will's eyes, right? Like his interactions with Carlton, who goes to a prep school. And for Carlton, it was never a question of if he would go to college. It was, you know, is he going to go to Princeton or somewhere else, you know? And for Will, uh, college just wasn't on his radar. You know, he was growing up raised by a single mom in Philadelphia and just wasn't uh, an academically focused student, although he was revealed to be academically gifted. Right. He takes a test and I think he actually um, outperforms Carlton on one of the standardized tests in the in, in the show. And he yeah, he's he's given like a sort of a tentative offer to Princeton. But uh, and, and Carlton actually doesn't get in. And then they go they both go off to, to I think ULA. It's a fictional within the world, a University of Los Angeles. Um. And so I resonated with that, too, about like the class elements. I wondered why Carlton cared so much about going to college because his family was already rich. They had a butler. You know, Will would make jokes about like taking out the like Uncle Phil's Lambo or the Jag and like, you know, why do you care so much? about? It? So so that, that was like an indicator to me that like college was something that people cared about. Um, when I was a kid watching this because people around me that I was growing up with, you know, they didn't, you know, they college just was not an important thing. And then with with the West Wing, I watched it years later. Um on the advice of someone who was a college graduate. And, you know, by that point, I was starting to take my education more seriously. I was still enlisted at at that point, but I was starting to consider actually going on to higher education and pursue that as a path. And so, you know, when someone who graduated from college tells you, you should, you should watch the West Wing. I'm like, okay, well, I'll check this out. Maybe I can glean something useful from it. And, you know, I also had this sort of these worries that that was, um, like if, you know, if this person's recommending the show to me, like what if I get to college and people ask me about the show and I don't know what they're talking about? And so that was also another worry that I had as concern. So I watched the first two seasons. I didn't actually enjoy the show that much, uh, but the, there were elements of that show that appealed to me too. 
I mean, the, the characters, the way that they would brag about their educations. Um, and, you know, there's this scene where C.J. Craig, the, I think she's the communications director. She uh, um, asks President Bartlett, uh, you know, why did you go to Notre Dame? You got into Harvard and Yale and Williams and all these other fancy schools. And I'm like, yeah, like these people love college. Like, yeah. yeah, they're always talking about like what your college pedigree is. And, you know, this guy's the president. Who cares where he went to college? Yeah. But that's something that they focused on. And so that was interesting to me as well. The, the, the way that the characters talk and spoke. And then later on, I, I did grow to enjoy like Aaron Sorkin's movies and mm. loved like Molly's Game. And, but you didn't uh, think the West Wing was very good straight off the bat, which I, I, yeah. I, I actually want to just stay on that and sure. dig into that for yeah, a yeah, minute because the West Wing was beloved in my house growing mm. up because, well, you know, Two, two reasons. My brother one, my brother was very smart and wanted to be in that world. And he eventually went to Oxford and did his internship in Congress. Mm. So it was mission accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad used to say this thing. My grandfather died unexpectedly in 1986. So I never met him. My dad always said this thing. He's like, I could feel my dad watching the show with me. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of for some reason it had this kind of, you know, it was associated with... Uh, this is something that I would want, my, you know, to show to my dad and I'm showing it to my kid. It's saying something I that I think is right. And you pointed out, didn't you, the West Wing is popular with a, t a certain type of value holder. Someone, yeah. well, what is it? Yeah, so when I when I wrote that, that, um, that essay in the New York Times, uh, I pointed out that one reason why this show didn't appeal to me was because it, it wasn't really meant for for people who didn't attend college, right? So, so I watched this interview with Aaron Sorkin. Uh, with, you know, he was being interviewed by David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, and Aaron Sorkin said that when they screened the the pilot of the show, the first season of the show, it didn't test well generally. Like it actually didn't get very good ratings, but it got extremely uh, good ratings from uh, a, a subsection of of the viewership, which were people who. So there were there were three qualities they tended to share. One was the households that earned more than seventy five thousand dollars a year. Uh, uh, households in which there was someone with a college degree and households that subscribe to the New York Times. And I, I uh, discuss at length in this essay, which people can check out, uh, you know, those are the three, those are actually the three qualities of, of class, at least uh, as, as some um, social critics and sociologists define it, which is uh, 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 economic capital. So of course, $75,000 a year or more. So households that are relatively well off, especially at that point in 1999. Um, uh, educational capital, right? Uh, where you know people who had at least one you know a college degree and then subscribe to the New York Times, which is uh, an indicator of cultural capital. People who sort of stay up to date on the trends, on the tastes, on the sort of relevant socio political issues of the day, uh, and those were the people who liked The West Wing. And I was not a member of any of those categories. You know, I, I grew up in a in a low income uh, you know, family, and I you know no one in my family went to college. And at that point, you know, didn't I didn't read the New York Times. Yeah, I wasn't reading any news. I mean, my my, you know, I was later, you know, my adoptive parents, they, they subscribed to the local newspaper, but you know, we didn't have, you know, we couldn't afford cable. We didn't watch any of the big, uh, you know, cable again. We, yeah, we didn't watch any of the big like political shows or anything. It just wasn't, it wasn't a part of the conversation the way that I grew up. And it wasn't until later that I took an interest in these things. Uh, much later, I, yeah, I guess in a way I, I was kind of a, like a late bloomer in the sense that I didn't figure out what I wanted to do until much later in my life. Um, and and these shows sort of illuminated this path to me of like the importance of education, the importance of uh, of like here are the sort of the stepping stones to towards social mobility. And yeah, I guess that was a sort of an implicit message throughout was, uh, you know, the ways that television, especially if you're in an environment where people around you maybe aren't that ambitious, TV shows can sort of shape what your ambitions will be. Yeah. And, you know, I, I sort of wrestle with this idea of did did these shows tell me what to want or did they reveal to me what I wanted all along? And then they just sort of showed me the, 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 the option was available. The weird thing about the West Wing is that you didn't like it, but it did show you what you wanted. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I suppose it's not that controversial. You do like the Sopranos, but you yeah. don't want to be an organized crime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, yeah, that's a good point. And, and I stuck with it and I, I tried my best to understand the appeal of it. And at some point I, I should probably do like a, like revisit the series. Um, 
but yeah, there was a there was something there that I I, I just didn't quite connect with. I'll bet now I, I there's probably like embedded like uh, um, subtleties and stuff that I that I would catch now that I wouldn't have got then. Uh, the other thing is like maybe uh, uh, so the show also aired on like network television mm-hmm. in the late '90s slash early mid 2000s. I believe the West Wing and The Sopranos yeah. started in the same year. Yeah, and and I do wonder if um, if the West Wing had aired on HBO mm. or something where they they didn't have to follow the sort of pacing and the formatting of a network television program. If maybe I would have responded to it more, or, or maybe even less. I know I, I do know what you that. mean though. It like yeah. had commo- arcs between commercial breaks and stuff. But the, 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 maybe I'm just not a fan of like that kind of overtly political content either. Like I wasn't the biggest fan of House of Cards. I also didn't like. Um, uh, Sorkin's other uh, uh, was that show where he did on HBO. He actually did a show on HBO. Um, I don't remember the name of it. Uh, the newsroom. Newsroom. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I, I watched the first season. Couldn't get into that either. I mean, it's so funny because I, I like his his movies. And so maybe the reason why I don't like these shows that he did is because of the the political content. I just don't connect with it as much. Yeah. But I do know what, I do know what you're driving at. There's something about the Sorkin content that all kind of coalesces around. The, let's say that like the Hillary Clinton uh supporting yeah. side of things and i'm not saying i'm not saying that anything like virtuous about supporting donald trump what i am saying is i think the reason i brought up clinton was because that was like the peak of liberal well-educated affluent america being completely tone deaf mm. the peak of that was 2016 with the hillary campaign and mm. i think it started in some sense it, 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 i can't claim this kind of causality but the west wing is an early canary in the coal mine for that because you know like you said the audience who were interested in it were those type of people Mm. and there's also something i i I, trying to rewatch this west wing when i was a bit older there's something very sanctimonious about it all the good guys (laughs) get to make full interrupted speeches where they get to be right about everything and their opponents sit stumped while they be wrong in their you know like in their villainy Mm. um there's that scene i sent you on whatsapp where josiah bartlett lays into a like basically a republican radio uh, personality uh, yeah. for thinking homosexuality is an abomination and yeah. just reels things off like an expert genius while she just sits there like fuming about how wrong she is and you know it's it also all, it, there's all the all the dialogue is perfect for all the heroes you know fans of the show will point out that there's like you know there are there are These strong monologues. republican characters and stuff like that but it yeah. can be quite sanctimonious the west wing it's quite um it's quite transparent about what it thinks is right and wrong and where those where right yeah. and wrong lives politically and it and it directs you with with the music and the cameras and the lighting and it's just it, it feels to some extent like as i'm as i'm thinking about those the the, the episodes that i watched yeah there's like a manipulative component to which i guess you could say for every tv show there is you know they're, they're trying to get you to feel something but for this one yeah it's it's perhaps even more so uh, and, and that may, you know, maybe why after the, the second season, I'm like, okay, I, I sort of get it. And that's, that's well, I mean, enough for me. It's almost, it's know. almost, it's they're almost, it's almost alarming how obvious they are about it. The, the fact that the protagonists are the democratic party, you know what I mean? Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and you're right. There were, there were some, some, uh, 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 Republican characters that were portrayed well and, and it tried to be bad fair. Democrats, but. Yeah. But, but by and large, yeah, it had a, a worldview and it was, um, yeah, it, it just it just seemed designed to to sort of comfort you know those those highly educated, uh, uh, well to do viewers and which but is this, fine. Like you are on the right path. Yeah, and and I could imagine um, maybe people feeling this way about other shows too. Like like Mad Men, I I would guess like they, there was probably a lot of overlap between West Wing fans and Mad Men fans. You know, highly educated, you know, make, you know, uh, higher income, and so forth. Um, but, but Mad Men, there was a subtlety to it that I appreciated and there was a depth to the characters and, you know, of course they were different eras, right? Like Mad Men was sort of post Sopranos into the realm of prestige TV where you could have anti-heroes and complex characters. Whereas West Wing, it was still in that era of like good guys and bad guys. And yeah, maybe, maybe that's just sort of where, where, uh, where my tastes tend to tend to drift, right? Like mm. the sort of the, the complexities and the anti-heroes and so forth. Uh, and yeah, so that's that may be why like those two shows we've been talking about, Sopranos and Mad Men, have 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 been so interesting to me. Yeah, it was also interesting when I watched that Emmys uh, moment I mentioned before, where Gandolfini won Best Actor. He was up against Martin Sheen for The West Wing. All right, well I'm glad Gandolfini won that. <laughs> yeah, because Martin Sheen's great, but he's kind of, by and large being Martin Sheen, isn't he? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. And Gandolfini, yeah, I mean this like, Tony Soprano is a character, right? Like he's. 
you know, I, I don't think most people don't, don't don't reference Josiah Bartlett as like a particularly complex or nuanced. He was just like a straightforward good guy. Although there was that that sort of subplot where he was hiding an illness from the American public, uh, to, to, which gave him a little bit of uh, of a nuance and subtlety. But but um, you know, overall, he was just like a straightforward you know uh, uh, noble president. Yeah, and and that felt much more like I hate to have to say it because I, I don't want to criticize Aaron Sorkin too venomously because he's very very good writer and has done mm. more in his career than I will likely do in mine. But the reveal of the MS thing felt more like a soap opera than like <laughs> okay. a, a, than a complex drama. Yeah. 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 I mean, and yeah, again, like I, I'm a huge fan of his, his movies and I enjoyed the, the Steve Jobs biopic and uh, Molly's game and yeah, the Moneyball. I thought, yeah, these are, these are all great uh, movies and I've enjoyed them. So yeah, although I have, yeah, I haven't seen his latest. Oh, I did see. So, so, uh, in London, I saw he, uh, um, to kill a mockingbird. He, yeah, to kill a mockingbird. He wrote the, 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 the play for that, the adaptation. And I thought that was well done too. So yeah, yeah. It's just, um, just the West wing that, the, you know, I, but I haven't seen his other be like his non-political TV shows to be fair. I know he's done like studio 60 yeah. and, he must have done at least one or two others that I haven't I haven't seen. But even um, to, to Kill a Mockingbird, I don't know mm. when that was written. I suspect it was going against the grain somewhat because mm. it's about a lawyer representing a, an African American defendant, isn't it? Yes, yeah, Which that's right. Not at all going against the grain in current in like so you know the uh, if you're a wet, if you're a successful Oscar winning writer yeah. writing a story about. Well, I mean, now it, it kind of depends because okay. now I think there's the, the criticism of, of that. So so it's it's going against the grain in that like the criticism of To Kill a Mockingbird is like the white savior archetype. Okay, okay. Right. Of like a lot of a lot of people will criticize the portrayals because or the, or the, or the storyline because it's, you know, oh, OK, so you have this white man trying to save, you know, like, do we really need their help? Like mm -hmm. the, that kind of thing where it's promoting this view of like, uh, you know, you need you need, uh, you know, this this white guy to come and swoop in and save you um but yeah i mean i thought the play was was well done and it was uh yeah it was well written and entertaining and i, I wondered you know because i remember reading in in class you know it just like you know, well, of course, like any, 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 you know, sort of book from, from that era, if you try to read it like a 15 year old, they're just not going to, they're just not going to absorb it. Whereas this time around, like watching it uh, acted out, it was, it was very well done. Um, and, and you could tell like Aaron Sorkin had adapted it, right. The, the sort of fast paced rapid fire dialogue, yep. the sort of the, the witty back and forth repartee was all like extremely well done. There's everyone constantly walking down corridors. Uh, <laughs> we should probably, uh, we should probably stop it there because um, Patrick's been sitting diligently behind the camera for about like an hour and 40 minutes now just letting us chat away so but we'll pick this back up when i finish sopranos we'll do some more analysis of that of what's going on and what it's saying about us and why we like it but this has been good stuff you've just done your phd so just quickly tell us what's next for you rob and then we'll see you next time yeah i uh, so just defended my phd for the yeah for the next few months i'll mostly be working on running my Substack, rob k henderson.substack.com and uh, I have a book coming out in early 2024. So that's uh, that's where my, my attention is. Oh, and you can follow me on Twitter at Rob K. Henderson. Yep, you can follow him on Twitter. For now, if you're not a Twitter doomer who thinks it's about to be blown up. <laughs> yes. So there you go. There's where to reach Rob. Thanks for another great chat. Let's do this again sometime soon. Sounds great. Thanks, Greg.